Welcome everyone, you're about to see Breaking the Frame, Revitalizing and Redefining Reproductive Rights Media Coverage. My name is Amy Newman. I'm the managing editor for rhrealitycheck.org. For those of you who don't know about us, we are a daily online publication focused on global, reproductive, and sexual health news and information. What you'll see today is a discussion that covers deconstructing the extremist, anti-choice messaging and agenda. And with the help of our panelists, we talked about what messaging could and should look like when we all work together, professional advocates, bloggers, and the mainstream media. So watch and enjoy. Hello, everybody. One of the strategies that advocates decided to come up with and that we had actually gotten from um, Germany, the German health department had run this um, big campaign to reduce HIV in, in their country. And one of the ways they did it was they ran this condom campaign where people, young people made posters um, and they drew these posters that were basically made out of condoms. And every year they would have these posters. These posters would end up being billboards. They would end up all over the, the country. Um, advocates contracted with them to be able to do that. And so we started doing running this condom campaign on our website where young people could go in and they can draw these posters. And we did, we judged the contest and we basically awarded um, money to those top three people who won from all over the country. And we've been doing that every year. And when they go on and draw these, they also then are clicked into a lot of information about condoms and, and the benefits. And there's even a sheet there that tells people how to use them, but also all this information about how, where you can buy them, where you can get them in terms of Planned Parenthood and stuff. But it is basically we decided to do our own since the CDC wasn't going to do it anymore. We decided we should do it ourselves. One of the things that we thought what you really needed to do was to make sure that young people knew what was going on. That they not only had information, but they knew how they could have an impact. So part of what we do is we have a number of what we call youth councils. We have a young woman of color youth council that actually works on HIV prevention with their peers. We have um, a council of LGBT youth that also works on a number of issues around GLBT issues with their peers again. We um, train young people. We have a thing called the Urban Retreat where we bring almost 80 young people a year into DC and we train them on all kinds of different issues as well as making them spokespeople around this issue and taking them to the Hill to meet with these members of Congress and telling them what they should be doing as opposed to what they currently are doing. We also um, are, are working with them in terms of changing the framework of how people talk. One of the things, especially when working with women of color, um, Latinas and African American women, is that the issue, the word reproductive rights doesn't quite work. And that what happens is when we talk from a framework of abortion rights, it's a no, it's a non-starter. And what you'll get is people talking about reproductive justice because what's in there is the, the ability and the right to have children, not just the ability and the right not to. And that comes from a whole American historical framework of sterilization and forced birth control and things like that. But part of what we need to be doing as we talk about different issues is making sure that we are talking about them in the framework of inclusivity. Even if you're writing about birth control or sex ed or something, you'll have a bunch of anti-choice people show up in your comments and the first thing they want to do is talk about, do you think life begins at conception? Do you think it's okay to, to kill a fetus two days before our mother gives birth? It's not about the fetus, it's not about life, it's about women's rights, and sexual phobias, like hang-ups about sex. That's why the same people that say they're about fetal life are against comprehensive sex education, are against birth control access. I mean, that sort of thing doesn't make much sense. So what we can do as an alternative to the mainstream media is push our frame out there and say, no, this is about 
having a healthy attitude about sexuality and about women's equality and women's rights. If somebody wants to talk about the fetus and you're going with that, you say like, well, I think that the best way to prevent abortion is to prevent unwanted pregnancy. <laughs> You know, so let's talk about that. You know, there's little ways to redirect the conversation back into our frame. I don't know how many of you know about this, but in Colorado, they've put a ballot initiative to define personhood as starting at conception, which is even before pregnancy begins. Um, and the reason that they're doing this, they'll tell you that it's, well, actually, they won't even tell you it's about abortion. They'll just give you some you know, hokum about respecting life. You know, they don't even want to talk about restricting women's rights. They want people to believe that a birth control pill and especially emergency contraception, cr like kill a baby, which is completely ridiculous. Both those birth control pills work by suppressing ovulation and so does emergency contraception. It's just a high dose birth control pill that you take after sex in the hopes that you'll suppress ovulation before the sperm get to your fallopian tubes. That's how it works. <laughs> when fighting the right, we need to look at the places where they're trying to confuse the issue about what's an abortion and what's birth control and call them on it and say, look, no, emergency contraception is called contraception for a reason. Um, I don't think that that's a damaging message to get out there, you know, to say like abortion and contraception are different things. And then explain to people, as much as you can that they're trying to confuse these definitions um, because, and it all comes back around to this, they're afraid of sex and they don't want women to have equality. Before I get into any um, specifics, I'm going to start with a little bit of fear mongering. So there's some statistics about why women should be involved in, in health care reform. Uh, the first one is that women are more likely than men to require prescription drug coverage. Um, 50 to 30, 50 percent of women are, and 31 percent of men. Women are more likely than men to have a chronic condition requiring care. 32, 26. Um, and here's one that's really interesting that actually ties into what Marcella was saying about young people, and also ties into um, women's concerns across the lifespan. Women are more likely to have dependent health coverage. So 24 percent of all women ages 18 to 64 have dependent health insurance. And here's where the fear mongering comes in. Opponents of women's reproductive health are already powerful players in national health care reform circles. So this is the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Catholic Health Asso Association, the National Association of Evangelicals, the National Right to Life Association, the Family Research Council, and Concerned Women for America are all part, all those organizations are part of conversations about health care reform already. We've been doing a series of small group discussions uh, with different groups uh, around the country um, about talking to people who aren't part of this conversation as yet. Um, so we did uh, conversations with different groups of women of color. Um, we did a, a great discussion with um, Low Income Teens Project run out of the NARAL New York office. Um, and one of the things they said, which really is um, struck me based on what Marcella's comments were, one of the things they said, well, you know, why isn't uh, sex ed part of health care? Um, and this, you know, a young woman raised her hand and said, why isn't this part of health care? And that to me was really powerful in that it made, the, it flips the frame immediately. If you say sex ed is a health care service and not some weird social service that is done in schools or is done by parents or whatever, if you say this is a matter of public health, then it's absolutely unacceptable to provide anything other than comprehensive sex education. There's a spotlight right now, and we want to make sure that we get at the issues, um, like Andrea was saying, that really broaden the frame to things like pre-existing conditions that, of course, are relevant, like I said, by virtue of pregnancy to women, but also um, to their families in other different ways. And so um, we want to get make sure that women and their families, talking about women's health issues, are part of these conversations now. And so we don't find ourselves in 2009 or 2010 when there's a national health you know, plans being batted around, uh, having to sort of elbow our way into the conversation because we haven't been there from the get-go.